So koho rashada kahala busida. Lo rashada kahala busada. We need to have a talk about the misinterpretation of the book of Acts by Pentecostal churches. This has been the foundational piece of scripture by which these types of churches have been built upon. The hand clapping, foot stumping, tongue talking, Holy Ghost sanctified church. As I mentioned in other videos, I grew up in this church and the book of Acts is where all of my questioning started. So what exactly do they believe? The minor details may vary from church to church, but this is the background. The opening chapters of Acts describe the apostles waiting for God to send his Holy Spirit as Jesus instructed them to. The Spirit falls upon them and they begin to speak in other tongues foreign to their own. The city people see this and are in amazement that these men are able to speak these other languages when they are clearly simple and unlearned men. It's obviously a miracle of their God, Jesus. Peter then proclaims the gospel and beckons listeners to believe and trust in Jesus as the one true God. The main scripture of just about all of these Pentecostal churches is Acts 2 and 38. And it says this. And Peter said, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The verse ends by saying 3,000 were converted and saved that day. So, here's how they interpret this into doctrine. Because the apostles spoke in tongues when the Holy Spirit fell upon them, the church believes this is the only way to truly be saved. They also like to juxtapose John 3 and 5 with Acts 2 and 38. Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit. Born of water meaning baptized in Jesus name. Born of the spirit meaning the Holy Spirit, Allah being filled with the Holy Ghost. Therefore, according to their doctrine, no man can enter the kingdom of God unless they are filled with the Holy Ghost. When the apostles were filled with the Holy Ghost, they spoke in tongues. So the church concludes that tongues are the only initial sign of being filled with the Spirit. But here's the problem. When I was supposedly filled with the Holy Ghost, I did not speak in tongues. It was just gibberish. I felt nothing but fatigue, and I wondered why. This was the beginning of the end for me. Studying these scriptures without indoctrinated bias I saw the teachings were wrong. Here's what that story means to me. The apostles simply spoke in other tongues through the power of the Holy Spirit to compel, show, and prove to all seers that their God was real. The apostles spoke in the languages of all the different countries represented there, and what they spoke was the gospel of Jesus. Tongues was simply a tool used by the apostles as a miracle showing for unbelievers. I brought my interpretation to church leaders looking for further insight, and here was their rebuttal. They pointed me to Acts 19, 1 through 6, which says, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus, finding a certain disciple. He said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were ye baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. Then Paul said, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people, 
that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. This is a favorite scripture that many of them like to use to bolster their claim that speaking in tongues is necessary for salvation. Here we see that Paul meets some disciples and asks them if they have the Holy Ghost. They say they've never even heard of it and they explain how they were baptized under John the Baptist. Paul then baptizes them in Jesus' name, lays hands on them, and they begin to speak in tongues. Now does this prove the doctrine to be true? Not to me. These people Paul spoke to were simply given the same gift the apostles were given, foreign tongues to spread the gospel. It said they prophesied also. I like to believe that means they went on to proclaim the gospel of Jesus, preaching. Here's another question I often wondered concerning the doctrine. Are tongues the only evidence of the spirit or are there others? Here's what I was told. Apparently, there is a difference between the gift of tongues and the tongues that come through the infilling of the Holy Spirit. So I wondered where that distinction was made in Scripture. 1 Corinthians 12 is where I was pointed, particularly verses 7 through 10. The chapter starts off with this scripture. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. And then Paul goes on to list the various gifts of the Spirit. Some are given wisdom, some knowledge, some the gift of faith, some the gift of healing, to some the gift of miracle working, to another the gift of prophecy, then there's the gift of discernment, to some the gift of diverse tongues, and lastly, the gift to interpret those tongues. So the gifts of the Spirit I just listed are different from the gift of the infilling of the Holy Spirit, which is simply speaking in tongues. The church believes everybody will speak in tongues when they are first filled with the Holy Ghost, but then they will be endowed with different gifts of the Spirit afterwards. So, my understanding was a person can speak in tongues when they first get the Holy Ghost, but will not be able to do it again if they do not have the actual gift of tongues. Confusing, right? Yeah, I know. But, okay. I was willing to accept that explanation, but my lingering question was, do all people who are filled with the Holy Ghost actually speak in tongues? In my experience, I've seen many people filled with the Holy Ghost and speak some gibberish, but then I've also seen many attempt to be filled and not receive anything. So how do we reconcile this? Church leaders say those that did not receive it have not simply surrendered their hearts or have not truly repented to God. Yeah, okay. For a time, I was even willing to accept that answer as well, but the dots were just not connecting. Where in the Bible does it say that one needs to even speak in tongues to go to heaven? Remember the doctrine. To inherit the kingdom, one must be filled with the Spirit. The filling of the Spirit is accompanied by the evidence of speaking in tongues. Thus, according to the Pentecostal Church, if you did not speak in tongues, you do not have the Holy Spirit. And if you do not have the Holy Spirit, you cannot go to heaven. If you can't go to heaven, then you're going to hell. Now, when I would break it down like that, it would rub a lot of people the wrong way. But that's the doctrine when broken down to its most fundamental core. It rubs Christians the wrong way because they know deep down how idiotic it sounds when you stop dancing around misinterpreted scripture and just state what you mean plainly. Also, how do we reconcile John 3.16 then, which says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Does this scripture get canceled out in favor of tongues? John 3.16 preaches salvation through faith, not tongues. And what of Ephesians 1 and 13, which says, And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him 
with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. This is another scripture showing belief or faith in Jesus as the means of salvation, not tongues. In Pentecostal doctrine, both of these cannot be true. What if I have faith in Jesus as the one true God, but I've never spoken in tongues? Why doesn't John 3 and 16 mention speaking in tongues as well as having faith? And why doesn't Acts 2 and 38 mention having faith as well as speaking in tongues? I guess it's all implied. I was taught there needs to be a witness present when one is filled with the Holy Spirit too. This is why during tarrying service in the Pentecostal church, there are many senior leaders present to help pray that soul through, as they like to put it. Otherwise, if you were to tell them you were filled with the Holy Ghost and no one was present to verify it, they'd look at you kind of funny. Well, that's unbiblical. One's conversion doesn't need to be some grand showing for all others to see. It's described as an intimate bonding between God and his child. The gifting of his spirit into one's body, completely changing everything about them and equipping them with the tools needed to carry out the work of his kingdom. It's a very sacred process. Your walk with God is a personal one, right? It's not for show. This is how I was thinking, and none of this was adding up. Lastly, let me point out Mark 16. These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Yeah, there's been so much debate around Mark 16. The two oldest manuscripts we have of Mark 16 concludes with verse 8. However, other later manuscripts have been found which added verses 9 through 20. Biblical scholars cannot agree whether these verses are legitimate or are forgeries added to persuade readers a certain way. And that brings me to my final point in all of this. You would think that if speaking in tongues was the true and only way to guarantee your salvation, the Bible would go out of its way to make that wholly clear, but instead it does the opposite. Church versus church, preacher versus preacher, Christian versus Christian. The Bible is a mess just like the Christian religion. God promised to preserve his word in Psalms 12 verses 6 and 7 which says, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them for this generation forever. God did not preserve these scriptures. The scriptures cannot be verified as truth. It's ironic because even the verse I just read has debates surrounding it because some versions of the Bible omit the part about preservation and or who is preserving it. It's comical. Christians are constantly trying to revise, remove, and excuse parts of scripture that do not line up with their doctrine. Just like this entire speaking in tongues debacle, it's all over the place. I often heard that God's word is so pure and simple that a child could pick it up and grasp what it means. Then they change that to, well, not necessarily. Some parts of the Bible are easily understood, but then there are some parts that are only understood through the Holy Spirit. And finally, they'd say, well, you cannot understand God's word at all unless you've been filled with the Holy Ghost. And you cannot have the Holy Ghost unless you speak in tongues. Hilarious. Listen, it's no coincidence that the more intelligent we as a people become, the more we drift further away from religion and deities. We're waking up. There's no need for gods anymore. The headaches born from constant questions, stress, and debates are completely unnecessary. The Bible has not been preserved by God, and you want to know why? Because he doesn't exist. Thanks for watching.